Honorable colleagues of the Reichsrat, some among you call me young and ambitious, even impetuous and rash. But I stand here today as a representative of the Progressive Party. I stand here to represent our hopes for the future. During this Weltkrieg, the Empire has bled and suffered. Let this sacrifice mean something. To the honorable members, I propose the following. We must go forward as an alliance of equals, a great Danubian federation at the heart of Europe. Look out the window, honorable members. There can be no pretense that the status quo is sustainable. Two dozen nationalities squabble while the nation stagnates. Your decisions today shape our collective futures, not just our own, but those of our children and grandchildren. Will they grow up without fear of war? Will they grow up to see a future where every man is equal, regardless of language or class? Or will this parliament entrench the old ways that have failed us? On all sides, our empire is surrounded by revanchists, extremists, and demagogues. But the true enemy sits inside this very parliament. Honorable colleagues of the Reichsrat, Austria-Hungary stands on the precipice. A house divided cannot stand. Choose the old ways, and our empire will rot from within. Choose Federation, and the world will witness the writing of a new chapter for Europe, penned by our many nations combined. Only in unity can we achieve greatness. Only in unity can we guide Europe to real peace and prosperity. I implore you all to choose progress, to choose Federation. Let the historians write that it was Austria-Hungary that led the world into modernity that we embraced the bright flames of progress, that we did so while the arrogant Germans guarded their precious nobility, the decrepit Kaiserreich. The story of Austria-Hungary, in many ways, is the story of the House of Habsburg. The vaunted family spread its roots throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and became a powerhouse of Central European politics for much of European history. While the family would breed many rulers, much of their power became concentrated in Vienna, later the capital of the Austrian Empire. Here they forged Austria as the successor state to the Holy Roman Empire absorbing enormous territories on both banks of the Danube. Later, the crown allied with the Hungarian nobility, forming the world's most prominent dual monarchy. This federal monarchist state would henceforth be known as Austria-Hungary. By the turn of the 20th century, however, the emerging idea of the nation-state threatened the multilingual empires of old. Austria-Hungary, beaten twice by Prussia, watched helplessly as her northern dependencies were forged into the formidable German Empire. The ambitious Germans united a powerful centralized administration and began industrializing at breakneck speed. Austria-Hungary, with her poor rural areas and vast unconnected territories, would slowly slide away and become a second-rate power in Europe. The Empire, which, less than a hundred years before, orchestrated the reigning order of Europe, now seemed an embodiment of the kind of decrepit feudalism from which it had emerged. As kindred peoples united in brand new nation-states, Austria-Hungary desperately tried to hold its many minorities under the imperial crown's sway. Soon, the empire was viewed with contempt, both within and outside her borders. The dual monarchy was loathed by Russia and the Balkans, preyed upon by Italy, and despised by revolutionaries. By the time of Franz Ferdinand's assassination, 
the opening shot of the Great War, Vienna had become dependent on German economic and military aid. The ancient rivalry with Prussia had become an alliance, yes, but a fraught one all the same. The Central Powers rallied behind Germany out of necessity and shared enmity for the Entente, but there was little love lost between them. Victory in the Great War would do little to settle the internal troubles of the Federated State. Austria-Hungary's performance in the Weltkrieg had made the Empire a laughing stock internationally and fueled internal dissent on how the country was managed. Things would come to a head in 1916 with the death of the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph. In November 1916, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria, died old and bitter. Riddled with pneumonia, many in the press likened the monarch to the sickly empire he led. Already in 1916, it wouldn't have surprised observers to see his struggling empire follow its emperor into the grave. Few, if any, in Vienna, Budapest, Prague, or Zagreb could even fathom the empire without Franz Joseph at the helm. As the people mourned their late emperor, the unprepared Karl ascended the throne, becoming sovereign of the Austrian and Hungarian realms. Franz Joseph's only son, Rudolf, had ended his own life many years before. The late emperor's brother had died soon after, and his nephew's untimely end famously led to the Weltkrieg. Only the heir presumptive for two years, Karl had barely been initiated into the business of ruling the chaotic nation, if at all. The task Karl faced was an unenviable one. Ever since the Ausgleich negotiations that established the dual monarchy, the empire had been walking on a tightrope. If the crown catered to the whims of the old German elite, it would risk upsetting the Hungarians, Slavic insurgents, or even Democrats in the parliament. If they instead chose federation, it would unravel the web of hereditary dependencies that still governed much of the realms. It seemed a political wind either way could sweep away the empire. And so Austria-Hungary stumbled on, mockingly called the second sick man of Europe, by both friends and allies. Although nearly everyone agreed that reforms were necessary, none could really agree on how those reforms should take shape. Progress in Vienna was made in inches, while the larger issues remained open. Austria had adopted a parliamentary system, which paralyzed itself over Bohemian language rights. Hungary, on the other hand, became a virtual one-party state, as conservative elements conspired to keep the status quo intact. The Weltkrieg did not do the dual monarchy stability any favors. Any notion that Austria was moving from a German autocracy to a more federal, multicultural and democratic entity quickly dissipated. The Austrian Prime Minister, Karl von Stürck, enforced a deeply conservative and pro-German cabinet, which dictated Austrian decision-making by decree. Hungary did not fare better. Although Budapest allowed for more freedoms than Vienna, the Magyar lands were far from a democracy. The Hungarian half was deeply conservative, inflexible and reliant on the old landowner rights of the aristocracy. Istvan Tisza, the Hungarian Prime Minister, relied on covert and secretive tactics to keep his coalition secure, including gerrymandering and restrictive suffrage. With democracy on the decline, confidence in Vienna reached rock bottom. In Prague, representatives took to the street against their lack of voice and the authoritarian policies of the regime. In Budapest, the ruling coalition feared the dissent would spill over, even as famine loomed. And all the while, the Italians, Russians and Romanians broke down the gates of the dual monarchy, eager to exploit its weakened state. The closing war years were marked with a rapid succession of parliamentary crises for the struggling empire. For the Habsburg domain to survive the Weltkrieg, bold action was not just necessary, it was vital. With few other options, 
The young emperor embarked on a series of reforms aiming to stem the turmoil in the Danubian monarchy and save Austria-Hungary from imminent collapse. Some time earlier, Prime Minister Stürk had been assassinated by political rivals. The Austrian emperor decided to instate Heinrich von Klam Martinich to lead a reformist cabinet. However, to restore parliament, Emperor Karl still required the backing of the German nationalists. These radical factions had no great love for the progressive overtures of the crown. For their political support, they demanded a heavy price. In exchange for backing a new administration, the emperor would have to press a long-time nationalist demand, the so-called Bohemian question. German would have to become the sole official language of the Austrian half of the empire for the nationalist bloc to agree to any restoration of parliament. Naturally, this upset not only the Czechs, but also the Polish, Ukrainians, Slovenes and Croats. Klam Martinich would end up recalling parliament with the promise to give in to the German nationalist demands. However, the cabinet wavered and walked back their promises in the 11th hour. Many saw this as weak and backhanded governance, unbefitting the offices of the Minister-President of Austria. Soon, Klem Martinich found himself with neither support nor credibility in the Reichrat, the Austrian parliament. His government fell not a month into his premiership, and Klem Martinich was replaced by the German-backed Ernst Zeidler, the new Prime Minister did not fare better. Zeidler was largely incompetent and unable to navigate between the Germans and the other ethnicities of the Empire. Despite his shortcomings, Zeidler's leadership continued, mostly as a result of Great War politics. The German Kaiser had openly threatened Emperor Karl not to replace Zeidler with the progressive Josef Redlich, who was strongly in favour of imperial reorganisation. Zeidler would eventually be sacked at the end of the war and not remembered fondly. Despite his black sheep status, Zeidler had made vital reforms to the food office during his term. His policies here engineered the so-called bread peace that would help Austria-Hungary through its darkest and coldest days in the final years of the war. The Hungarian part of the empire was plagued with much the same issues as Vienna. While Karl managed to rid himself of the chauvinistic and inflexible Tisza regime, there was no Hungarian faction strong enough to fill the resulting power vacuum. Eventually, the conservative but pragmatic statesman Sandor Vekerla took charge of Hungary. While Vekerla was definitely a conservative, he still proved far more flexible on key issues plaguing the realm. Even though his mandate within Hungary remained small, Bekele achieved minor reforms to suffrage law and deepened Croatian autonomy. This would lay the groundwork for the creation of the Illyrian crown later, a major breakthrough for modernizing the Austro-Hungarian state. The third year of the Great War in Austria-Hungary was marked by slow political progress and surprising battlefield successes. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk had knocked the Russians out of the war, followed soon by the beleaguered Romanians. Suddenly, two flanks of the empire were secured and only the Italian front remained. Despite these windfalls, the empire remained deeply paralyzed. A new political bloc was rising to force a breakthrough in the deadlocked parliaments of Austria and Hungary. This breakthrough would come from the streets, with two words that every politician dreads. General Strike. The honorable member from Styria objects to the motion. The motion fails. They should make those lines the anthem. From some far-flung area of the empire, Lord Something blocks any and all plans and nothing happens. How are we supposed to trust a place like that? that can systematically get absolutely nothing done for us. It's like they're in a different world. We could not care less about the policies of the Empire. We care about paying our bills. The Kaiser and the Emperor work us for their moronic conflict. They send 
our sons to die against the Russians and the Italians. But are we heard? <laughs> As if! No. We're just supposed to suck it up and work endlessly, building their cars and their guns and their shells, while the nobility gets to sit in their fancy houses, send their kids to a fancy school, get a fancy job arguing fancy nonsense in their fancy house. And who could even blame them? If they are never exposed to what life is really like here, why would they care? We should go to Vienna and make our voices heard. We are with many. We can grind the gears of the Empire to a halt, and it's been enough! Brothers of Budapest, brothers of Prague, will we let the elites dictate what our lives are like? Or will we finally, after all these years, do what the Council's never managed to do? Will we at last free the working men of Austria from this aristocratic yoke? Enough, brothers! Let us lay down our tools! I call for a strike! A general strike! The general strike of 1918, better known as the Janestreik, could have been the death knell for the struggling empire. Instead, Vienna was on the cusp of an early spring, at least politically. By this point, Russia and Romania had been knocked out of the war, and Italy was already on the back foot. The front lines of the Weltkrieg were moving even farther away from the borders of Austria-Hungary, and the country was in high spirits. In Vienna, victory was in the air. Quick concessions to the workers would extend the lifeline of the empire once more. Under the Redlich ministry, municipal electoral law was democratized, as local diets of the empire's many crown lands introduced universal suffrage. Democratic elections were announced for 1919, and a reformist mood overtook the Austrian part of the empire. It was not just Austria, however, that experienced a swing towards reformism. In the whole empire, the status quo was rapidly changing. Already in 1918, the prime ministers of Austria and Hungary had agreed to create a new constituent kingdom, Illyria. This kingdom consisted of the lands inhabited by Slovenes, Croats, Bosnians and Serbs from both Austrian and Hungarian territory. Although the new kingdom was nascent and troubled, the introduction of a Yugoslav kingdom in personal union with Hungary did much to ease Slavic tensions. In the north, too, Slavic reformists would get their wish. A constituent Bohemian kingdom would be re-established to appease the Czech people. While German nationalists remained staunchly opposed to Bohemia's creation, they had become politically marginalized following the election of 1919. The land of the crown of Wenceslas, as Bohemia was formerly known, crowned Karl its king on September 28, 1920. After this wave of progressive reform, the political pendulum would swing again. In outrage, reactionary and conservative Germans conspired to take down the Redlich ministry. The radical right wing of the empire attempted a reversal of the reforms that had empowered Bohemia and Illyria. Although the nationalist bloc succeeded in taking down the governing coalition, they soon found out they had overplayed their hand. When the general public came to the vote, it was the nationalists that were blamed for causing yet another round of political squabbling. The election that followed produced a surprise victor. Popular support had not gone to the conservatives, nor even the progressives, but rather the rising social democratic front. The emperor, in his elation, assigned Karl Renner to form a left-leaning cabinet despite the syndicalist revolutions that had shocked France and Italy some time before. This swing to the left was to the chagrin of the German Kaiserreich, which had grown paranoid of syndicalist incursion into her own language sphere. Relations between Austria-Hungary and Germany had become polite 
at best, and the idea that Vienna would seek closer cooperation with France made the German nobility nervous. In German newspapers, the Austrian emperor was mockingly called Comrade Karl, or sordidly, the Socialist Emperor. At the time, it seemed like the chaotic years that followed the Janusstreik and the Great War had solidified Austria-Hungary's evolution into a democratic federation of equals. In many provinces, Austrian and Hungarian chauvinism had given way to the popular Social Democratic Party, riding a wave of reformist fervor. Renner, who had become prime minister in the electoral upset of 1921, wasted no time trying to solve many core issues that plagued the empire. Many were worried that the socialist Renner ministry would inevitably drive the empire into syndicalist arms. In truth, however, the Social Democrats mostly shied away from major political reforms. The only true break with tradition Renner achieved was the enfranchisement of women. The ministry focused mostly on socio-economic reforms, the accessibility to social housing in cities like Vienna, Salzburg and Graz was expanded. Schools and kindergartens were secularized and the taxation system underwent a major overhaul to better suit Austria's new finances. In Hungary, too, a reformist mood set had overtaken the country. After years of conservative progressive domination, the failure of the coalition to meet popular expectations led to a victory of the Social Democratic Party under Mihaly Karolyi. Similar to Austria in earlier years, Hungary greatly democratized after the election of 1922, with universal suffrage finally introduced. Furthermore, Karolyi began undercutting the long-held power of the aristocracy by introducing major land reforms, which would dwindle the power of the landholding class. Under Karolyi, the so-called Aponyi laws were repealed, these had been a prominent aspect of the pro-Hungarian Magyarization policy of the last decade. They were a series of laws that had severely oppressed non-Hungarian minorities in its half of the empire. Removing the Aponyi laws extended an olive branch to minorities inside the Hungarian crown lands. Additionally, both Vienna and Budapest pushed back against militarist traditions which had severely undermined civilian rule and peace before and during the Weltkrieg. Seeing the military budget as increasingly unnecessary, a sense of peace and prosperity under responsible and representative government washed over the Danubian monarchy. But this era of optimism would, in the end, prove mostly gilded. Karolyi's ambitious government overstretched itself and quickly faltered against conservative resistance. In Austria, the death blow for the socialist experiment came quickly and unexpectedly. When in 1926 a general strike in the United Kingdom turned violent, wildcat strikes throughout Austria-Hungary sprang up in sympathy with British workers. While the government both silently and explicitly condoned the strikes, they faced increasing backlash from anti-syndicalist voices in the empire, which united under the conservative parties of the empire's constituent realms. It would not be long until the British strikes had turned into a full-blown revolution. As British aristocrats and royalists fled to holdouts across the empire, panic swept the conservative ranks of the Habsburg domain. Led by the devout Catholic Ignaz Zipo, Austrian conservatives started to pressure the emperor to dismiss Renner, fearing that Austria's fate was soon to share Britain's. The emperor, although startled by the revolt, refused to dismiss Renner. He had fought hard to restore the parliamentary system in his early reign, and he was unwilling to undo years of progress by interfering now. Despite the Emperor's support, Renner's government collapsed quickly after British syndicalists proclaimed the Union of Britain. Swept up in their victory in Britain, some factions within syndicalist France and Britain dared utter the words, World Revolution. In truth, those factions were political fringe movements at best. 
Despite this, the conservative newspapers and radios ran with the story, with enthusiastic support of the German Kaiserreich. The wildcat strikes in Austria were dispersed, and in a tide of anti-syndicalist sentiment, the conservatives swept to power. Syndicalism was now the unifying enemy, and the Austro-Hungarian pendulum had swung again. In Hungary, Karolyi's government collapsed with an even bigger bang. While Renner had largely remained silent on the wildcat strikes, Karolyi explicitly endorsed the British revolutionaries. After calling for a general strike in sympathy with the syndicalists in the United Kingdom, his coalition shattered almost immediately. As chaos erupted in the streets of Budapest, the Prime Minister was ousted in a vote of no confidence. The Hungarian gendarmerie battled with pro-syndicalist strikers in the streets of the Hungarian capital. Following the chaos, numerous prominent Hungarian leftists fled the country for the Commune of France, in the hope of mounting syndicalist resistance from abroad. The progressive days of the Danubian monarchy were numbered, as new, conservative, highly anti-syndicalist cabinets were formed throughout the realm. It was summer, I think, or at least a very warm spring. I was preparing the fields for the sowing when I spotted a large column of trucks speeding toward the capital. It was quite a sight, I can tell you that. Even during the Weltkrieg, I'd never seen that much armor near the estate. The fighting was always far away, in Poland, Transylvania, and the Alps. Now, it seemed like the war had come to Hungary. I wouldn't have given it much thought, were it not for the terrifying national address the Emperor had given the day before. Riots in Budapest, he had said. The socialist had taken to the streets. That no good jobless rebel. That's what you get for allying yourself with the Reds, I remember thinking. Our fool of an Emperor, Comrade Karl, who gladly accepted the reforms of these snakes in the grass. The local pastor was right, I tell you. Never trust a socialist. They promised us they were nothing like the French or British syndicalists. No, their aim was not revolution, but reform, you see. <laughs> and all the good it did us. The minute that leftist rabble saw the winds turn against them, they reached for rifles all the same. No good, jobless, loft socialist, syndicalist, Marxol, whatchamacallit, anarchist, Jacobins. Rats, the whole lot of them. Rats who deny the Hungarian way, the true way. We are simple people. We have no interest in these Western European fancies of socialism. One people, one nation, and only God can give the right to rule. That's the creed I live by. <laughs> I heard the leftists learned that lesson well that day. The city kids from Budapest, Pozhonye, uh, Kolozvar, got the hard end of a baton. The cold inside of a cell, and their entire government collapsed and fled. <laughs> now, Hungary is once again led by God-fearing men, and the socialist experiment is over. Good riddance, I say. Long live Hungary, and long live the old way. The syndicalist revolution had upset the political trajectory of the Habsburg Empire. After conservatives had regained their power in both halves of the empire, a veritable red scare swept across the nation. Conservatives and reactionaries refused to cooperate with the Social Democrats in nearly all matters, fearing that any concession would pave the way for another syndicalist revolution. The groundbreaking progressive reforms of the Social Democrats had ground to a halt. In Hungary, the chaotic collapse of the socialist Karolyi regime had left a bitter taste and Hungary turned instead to the old establishment, and did so quite literally. In 1926, at the age of 81, Albert Apogny rose to power again. The aging conservative led a cabinet stacked to the brim with anti-socialists and Hungarian nationalists. Despite this, Apogny returned to the political stage to reshape his legacy into that of a moderate conservative. In the closing chapter of his life, Apogny wanted to become the architect of a new political consensus. Such ambition was met with derision from the realm's many minorities. To minorities in Hungary, Apogny was an architect indeed, 
the architect of the hated Aponyi laws. These repressive Hungarization laws were removed by the previous regime, though, true to his word, Aponyi did not reinstate them. Perhaps the wisdom of age had indeed softened the grand old man of Europe. The new Hungary was much like the old Hungary, but bolstered by the public fear of syndicalism. Those not with the consensus, it was said, were with the Internationale. Aponyi enjoyed wide popular support as he began rolling back much of the reforms of the Hungarian socialists. Hungary was returned to its pre-1921 state, a highly nationalistic, aristocratic, and pro-Hungarian realm. Fearing the syndicalists more than their own elite, many welcomed the sense of normalcy the government seemed to offer. The conservative government was further bolstered by steady economic growth. Both in Austria and Hungary, the standards of living had been rising and business was booming. Radios, vacuum cleaners and electronic lighting became increasingly common in the vast nation. Although the conservative ministries took the credit for the prosperity of the late 1920s, much of it was only possible thanks to the reforms of the years prior, and such progress would prove to be rather fragile indeed. Dark clouds were gathering outside of the empire as well. By the 1920s, cracks were forming in the fragile sphere of influence Austria-Hungary has gained from victory in the Weltkrieg. To understand the dual monarchy's precarious position on the world stage, we must dial back to 1919 and the end of the Great War. When the Habsburg domain emerged from the Weltkrieg, it was not in any condition to annex vast swathes of land as the Kaiser had done. The Empire chose to only minimally adjust the border with Romania and annexed some territory in Montenegro. While the Bulgarian Empire to its south vastly overstretched itself, Austria-Hungary took a more careful approach. Like the famous Metternich had done just over a century before, Austria-Hungary would find its power not through military, but through diplomatic, dynastic, and economic ties. To understand the Empire's approach, we must turn back to 1914. The Habsburgs had spent most of the 19th century gradually being pushed out of their Italian holdings. The Austrian Empire had reached her zenith in 1815, but her territory had been in decline ever since. Even before the Great War, consistent defeats at the hands of France, Sardinia, Piedmont, and other Italian factions saw Austrian dominion of Italy reduced to just minor territorial possessions in southern Tyrol and the Austrian littoral around Trieste. The keenness of the Kingdom of Italy to incorporate these rich Italian territories into the nation had led to one of the bloodiest fronts in the Weltkrieg. The Italian Field Marshal Luigi Cadorna had sent wave after wave of soldiers in futile attempts to take the strategic city of Gorizia. The Habsburgs held firm, and after the decisive victory at Caporetto in 1917, their armies were poised for a general push into the Po Valley. In August 1919, that exact push would lead to the armistice with, and subsequent collapse of, the Kingdom of Italy. Eager on reversing the centuries prior, Austria-Hungary would occupy Venetia and Lombardy until a full settlement was reached. Shortly after the armistice was signed, however, Republican-led revolts broke out against the House of Savoy. Although the uprising made rapid headway in the north of the country, unity proved elusive for the new, young Italian Republic. Syndicalists instigated their own revolt within the Republican ranks, who were quickly pushed back to a small strip of land in Emilia-Romagna. The Italian Civil War forced an Austrian response. Both Republican and Socialist forces had been contesting Austrian occupation in the country's northeast, as neither accepted the 1919 armistice. It would be the fear of the Scarlet Spectre that would drive the various anti-syndicalist factions into Austro-Hungarian arms. Under the Treaty of Trieste in 1920, 
The fractured anti-syndicalist Italian states were nominally unified under the pro-Austrian Italian Federation. However, in practice, only the directly occupied Republic of Lombardy, Venetia, in the north, would truly follow Vienna. Like Italy, Romania had entered the Weltkrieg with major territorial ambitions on Habsburg lands. Ever since the principalities formally united in 1878, Austria-Hungary bordered yet another hostile state that desired the incorporation of one of the empire's many ethnic territories. In the case of Romania, that was the prestigious and coveted Transylvania. After the 1916 Russian Brusilov offensive had pushed Vienna to the brink, Romania eagerly joined the Weltkrieg on the side of the Entente. Her goals were clear. A crushing Hungarian defeat would secure the annexation of Romanian Transylvania. The decision would turn out to be costly. The Central Powers unexpectedly bounced back, and a force of Germans, Austro-Hungarians, Bulgarians, and Ottoman troops swiftly overwhelmed the country. It would take only three months for this allied force of nations to take Bucharest. Romania, however, refused to surrender. Instead, the government retreated to Iași, where it fought closely alongside Russia and France. When Russia faltered due to the outbreak of revolution, Romania was left isolated in the east. Her fate was sealed when Germany negotiated Russia out of the war with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Alone and outmatched, Romania was forced to accept the humiliating Treaty of Bucharest. Austria-Hungary ended up demanding only minor border concessions from Romania. This was contrasted by the fury of Bulgarian irredentists, who demanded the new Lion of the Balkans claim much of southern Romania. The real winner was Germany, however, that secured considerable influence in the Eastern Balkan states with the treaty. Despite its relatively gentle treatment by the Central Powers, a sentiment of national humiliation quickly gained hold of the country. Rather than turning to syndicalism, however, Romania's population turned to the Iron Guard. Led by the young and charismatic Cornelio Geller Codreanu, this was an ultra-nationalist, radically anti-socialist, populist, and xenophobic movement. To anyone witnessing the marches of the legionnaires in Bucharest, this much was apparent. Romania had neither accepted the results of the Weltkrieg, nor let go of her dream to unite all Romanians under one banner. Nationalism in the Balkans was an old headache for European diplomats. Such nationalism had, after all, started the Weltkrieg in Serbia not ten years earlier. As the Germans would later have it, it was Serbian ambitions on the Habsburg lands that would be the direct cause of the Weltkrieg. After rejecting Danubian demands following the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, Serbia kicked off a network of alliances that would end up radically changing the world order. Although it had initially survived bravely against the Austro-Hungarian onslaught at its borders, Bulgarian and German interventions would overwhelm the country in late 1915. As the Serbian government fled into exile, the fate of the combative kingdom fell to the occupying Austro-Hungarians and Bulgarians. Although the Bulgarians enforced their vision for their Serbian lands boldly and violently, the Austro-Hungarian occupation was as directionless as the nation itself. The belief of the military was that only a permanent and harshly enforced occupation could deal with Serbia as a direct threat to imperial integrity. This vision would also see small Austro-Hungarian expansion into key strategic strongpoints. This view, however, was not shared at home by either Budapest or Vienna. Then Prime Minister Istvan Tisza vehemently opposed any incorporation of Slavic lands into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, fearing it would only serve to further destabilize the domain and reduce Hungarian influence. 
Budapest would only support the incorporation of a minor strategic bridgehead into the Kingdom of Hungary. Vienna took an even more hands-off approach, preferably seeing Serbia as an aligned but independent state that would be bound to Austria-Hungary by economic means. In the end, amidst the internal chaos, the Austro-Hungarian army pursued its own policy. Serbia was being prepared for permanent military occupation. The country was demobilized, the education reformed, and civilian government was frustrated at any given opportunity. The annexationist policies of the armed forces would lead to a direct conflict with Tisa's Hungary, in which Budapest would eventually end up on top. After this tumultuous early occupation, Serbia would slowly be restructured in an Austro-Hungarian image. Pro-Austrian politicians, united under Vojislav Veljkovic, started working with the Austro-Hungarian occupiers to restore any semblance of a functional Serbian state. That said, the road to peace was long and arduous. Vienna had sworn a blood vengeance on Serbia, while the suffering of the Serbian people by years of economic exploitation had kept the population hostile to the central powers. By the time that Karl had ascended to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Austria-Hungary and the Serbian government in exile began searching for a diplomatic solution. The long and strenuous negotiations would eventually result in the Treaty of Vatolts. Serbia would be united with Montenegro, and the Kara Georgievich dynasty would be allowed to stay. Some territory would also change hands. The country would lose Macedonia, and the lands to the east of the Morava to the Bulgarian Tsardom. Austria-Hungary seized the Montenegrin coast. More importantly to Vienna, however, was that Serbia would fall almost entirely under their economic hegemony. Like Romania, its people had suffered at the hands of the victorious Central Powers, and, like Romania, it had been thoroughly economically subjugated to the victors around it. Again, like Romania, Serbia felt humiliated and spiteful. The monarchy held an authoritarian and pro-Austrian position, which made it highly unpopular throughout the country. But as dissent grew, so did the government's crackdowns. By 1921, Serbia functioned for all intents and purposes as a royal dictatorship, under the iron fist of King Alexander II. Almost immediately, however, secret societies dedicated to the anti-Habsburg Greater Serbian cause rose up. The most notable of these, the so-called Conspiracia, would indeed end up tearing down the monarchy. In 1925, rising bread prices would turn the Serbians from dissent to open revolt. Mass strikes sprung up with a demand to end the royal dictatorship, the government's reaction to the strikes only increased the violence that swept through the country. In response, the king returned from his winter residence to Belgrade on December the 3rd. The monarch arrived in the capital to deal with the worsening crisis, but his efforts were to no avail. As the king entered the royal palace in Belgrade, he would be assassinated by one of his trusted royal guards who presumably had close ties to the Conspiracia. Following the revolution of 1925, Serbia quickly declared itself a republic. The new republican leadership, although far less pro-Austrian than the late king, would abide by the Treaty of Vatolts. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was, thanks to its own internal divisions and chaos at the time, in no way able to exert much power let alone intervene in the Serbian crisis. Germany, far to the north, was occupied with fever dreams of syndicalism, and so the Balkans slipped farther away from the grasp of the dissolving central powers. Begrudgingly, Vienna agreed to work with the new republic. Although a new status quo was reached, Serbia would remain ever restless. The growing Conspiracia movement continued to stoke the fires of Serbian revanchism. For Serbian nationalists and their allies in the government and military, the dream of a greater Serbian state was far from dead, merely on hold.
Ever since her independence, Albania had remained an oddball within the complicated tangle of Balkan politics. Contrary to the quarrelsome Serbs, Romanians, Bulgarians, and Greeks, Albania's road to independence had been, at best, reluctant. Albania had wanted autonomy, sure, but only declared independence as a result of the ambitions of her neighbors. Rather than be absorbed by other Balkan powers, Albania sought international mediation. Plagued with anarchy and lawlessness, the European powers declared that Wilhelm, prince of the Protestant German Principality of Wied, would be the sovereign of the strange nation. However, upon his arrival, he was met with indifference at best and outright hostility at worst. Wilhelm's administration faced another crisis when Austria-Hungary demanded Albanian soldiers fight among them at the start of the Weltkrieg. Wilhelm refused on the basis that Albania was bound to neutrality by treaty. Having lost the support of one of his major backers, the Protestant German simultaneously faced several Islamic and pro-Ottoman revolts against his rule. The German prince quietly left the same year he had arrived. Wilhelm of Wied joined the Imperial German army, but officially kept the title of Albanian sovereign. This put the young nation in a strange situation where it itself was neutral in the war, while its sovereign was not. Albania remained in a state of lawless turbulence during the first two years of the Weltkrieg as it became torn by various warlords who aligned themselves with different national factions. Despite Albanian neutrality, it was invaded twice, first by Serbian troops in 1915 and less than a year later by the Austro-Hungarian troops pursuing them. Only with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 would the status of Albania be restored to any semblance of normalcy. As a concession to both Germany and Austria-Hungary, Wilhelm would return and the Principality would be closely aligned with Vienna. For Albania, the settlement was doomed from the very beginning. Wilhelm continued to face Islamic, anti-foreign revolts, which eventually culminated in the Albanian Revolution of 1924. Under the leadership of the militant Avni Rustemi and the flamboyant Ahmed Zogu, the revolt took advantage of the permanent turbulence in Austria-Hungary to rid itself of Habsburg influence and establish an Albanian Republic. Although Albania had rid itself of its foreign monarch, the nation remained under considerable Austrian influence. Tirana's desire to remain independent and Vienna's need of a reliable ally in the Balkans would continue to keep the nations aligned in the interwar years. Strange times made for strange bedfellows, indeed. The Weltkrieg had only deepened Austria's massive economic dependence on the German Empire. Without the Kaiser's massive economic and especially military aid, the survival of the empire would have been doubtful. But while posters during the Weltkrieg showed the great empires of Central Europe side by side, under the surface, there was trouble in paradise. The Germans' demand not to name the progressive reformer Josef Redlich prime minister in 1917 was a major cause of friction between the two kindred nations. And in the Austrian press, Germany was ever the boogeyman. Many went as far as to blame various political crises on German agents. The fall of the Austro-Hungarian socialists had been awfully convenient for Germany, after all. After Russia was forced to give up vast swathes of land at the end of the Weltkrieg, Germany and Austria-Hungary struggled to determine where borders should be drawn and how the new states would be influenced. Particularly Poland and Ukraine became contentious issues, with the two emperors frequently meeting to find a satisfactory solution. The empire had desperately wanted to bring Poland into its fold, but had found that in the end, the Empire could hardly leverage their influence against the overwhelming military and economic dominance of the Kaiserreich. Despite Germany's protestations, Austria-Hungary managed to exert some influence over Poland, 
by planting pro-Austrians in the King's Advisory Privy Council. Nonetheless, the presence of the German Kaiser's son on the Polish throne proved who was really pulling the strings. Austria-Hungary thus continued to play second fiddle in the new Eastern Bloc. They had gained some economic concessions, sure, but the new states danced to the Kaiser's tune, not a Habsburg one. The Kaiser's new Eastern map shifted Austrian influence to Galicia Lodomeria. This was a majority Polish and Ukrainian constituency inside the Federation. It swiftly became a haven for Polish and Ukrainian dissidents. Vienna harbored these rebels openly in a bid to increase her influence, much to the chagrin of Germany. Economically, Austrian desire to free itself from the Kaiser's firm grasp and be a great power in its own right led it to pursue a course of economic nationalism. First, Vienna restricted German access to Austro-Hungarian markets by letting the Treaty of Salzburg expire in 1926. While these policies caused a mild rift between the two former allies, relations between Berlin and Vienna remained cordial. Whether the Central Powers could stand united against the rising threat of syndicalism remained to be seen, however. During the early interwar years, Austria-Hungary refused membership of both Mittel Europa and the Reichspacht, steering an independent course. The empire was struggling, however, and the price of autonomy in a German-dominated continent was high. Austria's future was never certain. Countless times, the country had tried to rebound and rebuild. The tumult of 1926 had shown how fragile the empire truly was. The economic problems of the realm were alleviated, but never solved. The social democratic and later conservative policies had accrued a staggering amount of national debt. With her economy leveraged to the breaking point, Vienna and Hungary were always a minor setback removed from a full-blown financial crisis. The day of reckoning would come in 1931. That year, the Credit Sanstalt, the largest bank of the Danubian monarchy, defaulted one final time. It had reported a loss of 140 million kronen on May the 8th and was forced to declare insolvency three days later. What followed was a complete collapse of the Vienna Stock Exchange. People scrambled to rid themselves of their economic assets and shares as a run on the banks pushed the already fragile financial institutions over the edge. In what seemed like just three days, an era of stability and progress had come crashing down. In an attempt to alleviate the financial crisis, the Austrian government stepped in and restructured Credit Sanstalt. Unwilling to commit to radical economic measures, the conservative government split the shareholding between the state and the wealthy Rothschild firm in Vienna. While this prevented crisis from turning into recession, it made Austria-Hungary even more reliant on German loans. The fiscal strain of the crisis proved too much for Austria-Hungary to hold on her influence in neighboring nations. The revanchist Serbia, Romania and southern Italy acted swiftly to remove bankrupt Habsburg institutions from their territory. In friendlier states like northern Italy and Albania, economic ties simply dwindled into insignificance. By 1931, Austria-Hungary's fall from great power status was complete. Such a fall from grace would have been a crisis in the best of times. Unfortunately for Vienna, it came in the darkest days of the European 1930s. In Europe, the 1930s saw the rise of revanchist syndicalism and the resurgence of Russian nationalism. In Berlin, Budapest and Vienna, the words Second Weltkrieg were never far from anyone's lips. If there were to be a Second Weltkrieg, the Empire's position would, cynically, be much like during the First. Austria-Hungary would be divided, unstable and alone. Internally, 
Austrians, Hungarians, Czechs, Galicians, and Illyrians vied over the direction of the Austrian Empire. Despite all its reforms, the dualist system was still largely intact. The empire was as brittle as it was two decades prior, and its neighbors were even more eager for revenge. Once again, Austria-Hungary arrived at the same crossroads. Would it be able to resolve the issues inherent to the dual monarchy? Would the nation stand bright as a beacon of democracy? Or would it once again falter, weak and divided, and be driven back into Germany's arms? Darker tongues saw the turmoil in Vienna and Constantinople and thought otherwise. To them, the aging Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires were irrelevant relics of the past, living only on time granted them by Germany. The new world order that had emerged at the end of the Weltkrieg had already begun to falter. There was only one power in Europe still strong enough to hold back the syndicalists and Russians alike. According to such defeatists, there was no hope. There was no future. There was only the Kaiserreich. Against the machinations of the algorithm, will you stand? Kaiser Cat Cinema needs you. Subscribe on YouTube and connect with us on all channels. What if Germany had won World War I? This is the premise of a legendary series of alt history mods called Geiserreich. Geisercat Cinema is a collective of artists making crowdfunded content set in this world of Geiserreich. Our Geiserreich documentary series explores the lore and world building of this unique setting in long form video format. Our video series are stepping stones towards a big Geiserreich artbook project. The illustrations and concept art made for these videos serve as the basis for pages and chapters in the book. We call this mission a Kaiserreich show on every screen, a Kaiserreich book in every store. For this particular video, we would like to thank the Kaiserreich mod Austria-Hungary rework team. Vidya Rojak, Kirgeli, Kamrad Zim, Flamefang, Marcus, our wonderful narrator Patrick Warner and our editor Dave. For this episode, we would also like to thank our guest star Kraut, as well as voice actors John Kava and Ryan Jeffords. All our videos are funded through the sale of our original art prints and merchandise. Please consider visiting kaisercatcinema.com to get some of our unique handcrafted propaganda posters, art prints and more. You can also visit our sister project, Flagmaker and Print, allowing anyone to design and print their own alt history flags online. Finally, our projects would not be possible without the enduring support of our Patron Cameo program. Kaisercat Cinema patrons can make cameo appearances in our art and animations, immortalizing them as parts of our video series. I would like to thank in person our Kaisercats and Syndicats. These are top patrons donating $100 per month or more. The cinema recognizes James Carroll, first among equals. He is our oldest Kaisercat backer on the front lines for international democracy in both fiction and real life. He reminds us that all wars eventually end, but for the fallen they are never over. Godspeed James. The cinema also recognizes Odin, the Kaiser's chosen man, leading alongside loyalist forces. If God is with us, who could stand against us? Loyalist section leader Captain Max, fighting to liberate New York from revolutionary rabble. Mountaineers Dwiarani Calhoun and Ranmax, who guard the frontier of the last true America, the congressional western states. The cinema recognizes Gefreiter Connor Reed of the German Expeditionary Force providing air cover for loyalist forces. The cinema also recognizes syndicate ringleaders Liam Crowther and Alex LP at the vanguard of the fight for American socialism. Top patron Miles Sanchez, who has found a cure for revolutionary upstarts. 
high yield saturation bombardment. He says loyalists don't pray to God, they pray to the German artillery. Israel, one of the founding backers of the channel, he is the spearhead we will drive through the head of the revolutionary snake. Kaiser Bismarck of the Loyalist Navy, sailing out against the traitorous Red Navy so that he may make every man a king. The cinema also recognizes Bittersteel leading the Loyalist charge as tank commander, down with the traitors and up with the stars. They are joined by 150 plus other patrons appearing throughout all our videos and projects. Against the machinations of the perfidious algorithm, they will stand. But will you? Thank you for watching our Kaiserite documentary series. This is Vincent Danil, signing off, proud of the work we did. I will see you for the next one, guys. Vincent out.